Hi, this is Roger Frampton. For those of you who don't know me, Wessex Society member, committee member. And um, firstly, congratulations, because if you're actually watching this, then you've managed to get onto the internet and onto YouTube, and you're watching a YouTube video. So well done for that. I know some are strangers to that sort of thing. Um, things you might not know is I do run a YouTube channel. I post videos up there virtually every day, orchid related topics, mainly about what you can see behind me. This is my grow room. We'll go over that in a minute. But the idea with this is it doesn't replace the talk that I was booked in to do for the April meeting that then got moved to May and then <laughs> the, most of the year got cancelled anyway, so that just became a no-go. Um, the talk will still get done at a later time, but that's a slightly more formal talk in as much as it's a presentation with me there and you all sat in your seats. Um, whereas this is a chat. It's just a look around my orchids, my grow room, the kit, just, just a chat, which talking to Lynn about it seem to be a bit more suited to people who've got to sit at home and watch it. That's, that's the difference. You're not at the meeting. You're not with your mates. You're not sat in the comfy chair or that sort of stuff, although you're probably sat in a more comfy chair at the moment. But this idea of just a, an informal chat, looking at some plants and things like that, might be more suited to people stuck at home. You know, you're, you're now watching it in your own environment, on your own piece of kit, whether it's a laptop, computer or whatever. Um, or on your phone even, um, but it gives you access to uh, to effectively YouTube videos. And now that you've found your way here, in behind this video are about another 4,000 if you want to go and have a listen or watch, <laughs> if you can work out how to get back here in the first place. Um, but the idea with this was to do it via an email with a link. And the idea is you don't need any tech savvy or anything like that. You click on the link, you either get to the video or you don't. If you don't, I probably couldn't help you. If you do, you're here and we're up and running. So that was the theory. And um, that's just a little introduction, basically. And um, I'll take the camera off the tripod now and we'll have a look round. It's quiet at the moment. I've had to shut all the kit down, even though it's a nice day here. The temperature's climbing in here quite dramatically at the moment. So um, I need to get the kit back on to do its job, and then I can film it while it's on, and then we'll turn it off and get rid of the noise level and have a look at some plants. And, and let's just have a chat, yeah? For me, it's a Sunday morning. I do a regular video chat on Sunday mornings where I pick an orchid topic of some sort sometimes quite obscure um, and I, I do a Sunday morning video chat with the people who follow my channel and hopefully some of you will now come and join me and just remember our illustrious chairman now runs a YouTube channel she's doing it as well and it's coming on quite well I've got competition <laughs> but it takes quite a long time to build up a channel but yeah good stuff so uh, let's get going Okay, so this is all the kits on at the moment, so obviously there's a noise level. That's my extractor fan up there. It's an 8 inch fan connected up to a thermostat and it sucks hot air out into the uh, outside world um, quite efficiently. That moves quite a bit of air, that one. And it's got a little partner in crime down there, which is the inlet fan. So again, an 8 inch fan. Um, that sucks cooler air in and that air cy circulation works quite efficiently except when we have a heat wave and the air outside is warmer than it is on the inside in which case it makes it worse instead of making it better but under normal circumstances I can keep my temperature between around 25 and 28 now obviously once those fans come on I'm losing humidity and Hurricane Hector down here replaces it quite rapidly. So although it drops down, eventually, because that dramatically cools the air as well as making it humid, it's a dramatic cooling effect, that thing. Um, so eventually the temperature drops enough for the inlet and the extractor fan to switch themselves off again. At which point the humidifier, or hydrofogger, 
will keep going for an amount of time until the humidity comes back up to my setting, which is currently set at 75% um, or thereabouts. Um, some of the ga gadgets I use are not 100% accurate, but they're close enough. Um, and then up here I've got two large circulating fans, one of which oscillates up near the roof, again that stirs the air up, and then one down here that used to oscillate but it can't anymore because it's had to go tight to the wall, mainly because when I got this new shelf unit in to store all my rubbish on, <laughs> the stand wouldn't fit in there and I had to strap it to the wall without its um, long leg basically. So those keep the air well stirred up. Um, I think they're 16 inch fans. Um, they're on their low setting. Um, they've got a normal sort of uh, breeze setting. And then they've got a strong wind setting. And then they've got gale force, which is number three, which I very, very rarely use. But if it gets too hot in here, I will. Because airflow across leaves will automatically cool them down. Yeah? Even if <coughs> Excuse me. It's the same temperature. It still has a cooling effect. And then up there are a couple of little, um, I think they're five inch computer fans they are, so they're 12 volts. And they run off of that um, phone charger up there. <laughs> and there's a few of those dotted around. They just run 24-7. There's a couple up there sort of circulate across the roof. And then I've got some down here. And these work in reverse, so they're not actually blowing air out, they're sucking air in. Because they were too powerful, they were drying the plant's leaves off. So they draw air gently across this area, which is where I keep most of my cooler growing, shadier ones. Um, so there's a few there as well. So, as far as uh, temperatures are concerned, um, in the winter I go down to 12 degrees and that's controlled on a thermostat with a heater. Yeah, so um, when it gets down to uh, 12, or, or 11 in fact, the heater comes on and takes it up to 13, so it averages 12. Um, it's got a two, two degree differential which it works with. And that's my minimum night temperature through the winter. Um, the heater unfortunately is still in use at the moment because we're still getting some cold nights but hopefully that will stop soon and it can just get put away until the autumn again. Um, these little Inkbird gadgets up here are replacements for ones I used to have that were not very reliable. Um, so there's actually a um, thermostat here um, that's actually controlling these large circulating fans at the moment. So when the temperature in here gets to 21 degrees they come on and they stay on till it drops below that temperature. So that's that one. And then the other gadget up there is the hydrostat, which controls the hydro fogger down here, which is getting my legs absolutely soaking wet at the moment. Dripping wet down here. So I stood a bit too close to it. The um, inlet and the extractor fan have got their own little thermostat up there, that little square unit there. Cheap, cheap and cheerful from China, couple of quid. <laughs> uh, they are prone to going a bit wrong though, which is why I got the better quality replacements. Those aren't brilliant, but they're a lot better than the, uh, the other ones. So that's the kit really. The building itself is, um, it's, it's roughly a 2.2 meter cube with a slightly sloping roof. But yeah, it's about 2.2 by 2.2. There are no openings apart from the extractor and the inlet, which have just turned off. That's why it's gone a bit quieter, but not a lot. Um, so yeah, 2.2 along there, 2.2 along there. Those are double glazed glass panels. They've got the green type shade netting outside. And then on top of that, they've got the aluminium stripey shade netting. So two layers. I went down to one last year and mm, quite a few of my oncidiums didn't like it, which was pointed out in no, in no uncertain terms and, and was sorted. Now up here, this section here used to be an opening window that I sacrificed because it didn't work. It was rotten. So if you opened it, it fell apart and you had to sort of glue it back together again. So I took that window out, put a panel in so that I could have an extractor fan. And then unfortunately, I had to sacrifice another large pane of glass over there to be able to get an inlet fan. 
but it also gave me some places to put some fixings so um, so that's why that's wooden and not glass and um, the reason this black cloth is here is not to keep the light out it's because I do a lot of filming in this area and I've got another black cloth sits on there so I can set up like a little show area for some of my um, filming that I do so that's that uh, on the roof there's some bubble wrap once upon a time I bubble wrapped the whole of the inside for winter and I had to take everything out to do it and I swore I'd never do it again and unfortunately when spring came I had to take it all down again and I thought yeah and the roof stuff just stayed up there and it's staying up there until it falls down it's just too much like hard work putting it up and taking it down again and then outside on the roof again is the aluminium stripey stuff so that's that um, right okay that's that's the kit I wanted to film it with it basically on so you can see it running but now I'm going to turn it off and do some more filming because it, it, it's a, a bit intrusive with the noise level plus I'm getting my wig blown off here stood in front of the fans so I'll be back in a bit and then there was quiet there's a bit of banging going on outside somebody's doing some work you can't complain about that people doing work is not unnecessary noise I'm happy with that the dog starts barking that is unnecessary noise um, in which case I'll stop and pick it up again when the stupid little critter goes indoors um, right so what we've got here is effectively a southwest facing edge yeah so that's southwest therefore obviously this is southeast being that the Sun is up there at the moment yeah so the Sun comes over here across there round and eventually sets in behind this section here or it does in the summertime in the winter it sets there um, yeah so that that's where my light comes from obviously this time of year the Sun is pushing a lot more light in from the roof than it does in the winter in the winter the light mainly comes in through the sides so plants do get adjusted accordingly yeah because I've got some that need high light in the winter um, specifically to bloom so they have to be positioned in a place where they get their maximum light during the winter time so uh, and in amongst the shelves and the racks here I've got microclimates that I make full use of so top shelves are obviously highlight areas so and also I've got the light coming in from above this time of year and then as it comes around here all of the rest of the afternoon it's going to be coming in through here partly above and partly through the sides as it gets lower in the sky so these shelves along this end are my highest light shelf areas yeah so catlias in the main lower down <coughs> there's an element of shading so lower light level provided by the plants above yeah so when the light is at its strongest through the summertime it's coming in mainly from above so those on the top shelves shade those below so the more shade a plant needs the lower down it goes so as far as lights concerned I've got micro climates micro areas where the light is different and my shadiest area is here heavily shaded by racks plants larger plants up here so in here is my shadiest area and it has a constant airflow from those little fans to help keep it a bit cooler and in there there's assorted things some are looking a bit sorry for themselves because oops that's the fans come back on again let me just turn those off and the silence came back again yes yeah, so, um, this area here is plants that in theory shouldn't even be growing here at all because of my daytime temperatures the only reason that some of them are hanging in there reasonably well is the humidity level without that I've got well there's some you can see up the back there there's some quite large restrepias that aren't doing too bad that one isn't doing so good well it is actually it just caught the light last year <laughs> I went down to one layer of shade netting and that one didn't like it at all but yeah there's some quite large restrepias and 
various um, Mazda Valias. It's a nice bud coming on that one. Um, that Restrepia down there has actually got some blooms on. They bloom on and off all year round. Um, yeah, not all of these plants do well for me. Um, I'm surprised this one's doing well at all. It's actually a Miltoniopsis species. A strange thing to call a Miltoniopsis. It's actually called Miltoniopsis phalaenopsis. Will make your mind up already. <laughs> and there's a Dracula hanging up here. That's got a nice bud on it. That's Dracula Bella. And various other things. Some more little Restrepias up there coming on. Some Sarcochylus. They need moving. <laughs> they don't need the heavy shade. I read that wrong. And there's a couple of little Paphiopedalums up there. There's a little um, Delanartii, a Thompson, and a manky looking Mordier. Um, basically lost, it lost its main fan and left the weaker one, but it's coming on. So that's, that's my sort of shadier, cooler area. And anything that's in there is probably struggling a bit during the summer months and in the winter it loves it. <laughs> There's a little bulb of film tucked in there as well, mounted one. Nice plants coming on nicely. And then on the top shelf it's, it's assorted, it's just all sorts. It's um, mainly taller stuff, so some of my larger oncidiums. Sotoanum round the back there and this one is Tahitian Dancer, intergeneric. Some Dendrobiums that are tall, so there's various things there. This is a sorry sight. <laughs> I'll put a pop-up of the picture of what this looked like about five or six days ago. But they almost all opened together this year, apart from those few down the bottom and those few in the middle that opened late. But nearly all of the others opened together and it was quite a show, Dendrobium jenkinsii. But they don't last long. And of course, if they all open together, they all drop off together as well. That did look rather good a few days ago. On its way out now, though, and that's it for another year. Up here is my highest light area because the shade netting doesn't come fully across. So I've got two vandas up there. Um, they, they do okay. I've got this strange thing here, which I was given. I didn't ask for it. It was a gift from the um, speciotic plants on eBay. For, for including them in my video. Um, Ancelii africana. Um, strange plant because it's the only one. And it lives up there where it gets the best light because they live in the treetops. Very high light plant that. Um, recent acquisition. Um, each year I try a new genus um, or do my best to. And <sighs> Over the last couple of years, <laughs> I've been trying things that live in here. Like last year, I decided, well, if some of the Mastavalias and Restrepias aren't doing too bad, perhaps Draculas would grow okay. Well, that was a yes and no. But I've decided that we're not getting anything else that needs that environment because they don't like my summer. Yeah. But this year's new genus is Renantheras. Now... I've had to be selective because most of those are classed as warm to hot growers. Well, as I've already said in my winter, it ain't hot. <laughs> Cue for a TV program there. Um, but uh, yeah, so <sighs> by selecting things with story eye in them, it's more temperature tolerant and doesn't need quite so much heat to still be happy. In other words, it's found in various environments, including up the warmer end of intermediate. So it's not, you know, a warm to hot grower. So I decided to get one of those and um, I hadn't had it long. This is a good one. And we got purple leaves, didn't we? And why did we get purple leaves? Because I didn't stop and think where it came from and put it straight in the bright light. You're going to go from an unknown area to bright light, do it gently. Because it could have been kept quite shady before you got it. <laughs> and there's a few others of those. The other three are up the, up, the, up the back there. So those are my new ones for this year. One's actually an intergeneric cross with a Vanda. Um, the other two are, uh, are Renantheras proper. One's a primary cross and one is the species Imshutiana as in shoot with SCH, not just SH. 
So, um, types of orchids then, we've, we've done the sort of cooler stuff. Oncidiums and various intergenerics. Um, dendrobiums, lots. Um, including some that are not easy to grow. This is Dendrobium senilli. And I have known many people try and grow this, and they're really pleased because it grows pretty good for a year or so, and then it just keels over. Well, I'm managing to keep him, keep mine going, and it is stuck coming into new growth at the moment, so it survived the winter, and not a bad show of blooms either. Very attractive, those are. And I've got various long cane ones um, in bloom at the moment. Some of the um, others have already bloomed and gone over. Some are forming buds to come later. But I do have a lot of dendrobiums. A lot. <laughs> um, uh, more oncidium types. That's a uh, dendrochillum, which is going to somebody else. I'm not keeping that. There's some Miltoniopsis down in there. They don't do too well for me because, again, it's too warm. My little Deesa's not doing too well because it's my own fault. That should have been repotted in the autumn. Now, that had quite a lot of peat in the mix there, along with perlite and grit and various things, very finely chopped sphagnum. And it likes an acidic mix, terrestrial, obviously. Yeah, it likes an acidic mix, but it doesn't like a sour mix, does it? <laughs> I looked at my record, it's been in that pot far too long. And it's too late now, I've got a spike coming. So all I can hope is that some of the plantlets that are going to grow during this year, hopefully, can be rescued this autumn and potted up separately. Um, a few more um, Oncidium types. There's a little uh, oddity on the end. Um, that is, uh, oh, come on, Miltonia flavescens. Actually, I'll... I'll rename that. It's called Miltonia flavescens. Why the hell won't you bloom? So that's gone to somebody else to let them have a try. I've had that three or four years. It grows pretty good, but it just will not bloom. It's the only Oncidium type I've got that will not bloom. So let's let somebody else have a go. That's the way I look at it. Um, my only Cymbidium. That's going outside soon. So it's got a new growth coming. It's, um, it's not a strong plant, although it, it grows quite well, but it only ever produces one new growth. And for the last two winters, it's only produced one spike as well. But one new growth and one spike on a plant this small isn't, isn't, isn't bad. It lives outside most of the year. Um, what else have we got in here of interest? Uh, more dendrobiums. Ah, we have a Masdevallia on a high shelf. What's that doing there, I hear you ask? Well, as most of you will remember, we had a chat from a Mazda Valia specialist. And he said that on his travels, he found Mazda Valia ignea, okay, at a very high elevation, growing in the middle of a field with no cover whatsoever in full bloom. So when he got back from his jollies, he decided to give some of his uh, plants some more light and forget what it says in the books and all the ancient writings and scrolls that have been brought forward from one to another to another without ever checking to see if it's true. And um, a lot of his Mazda Valleys that were poor bloomers suddenly burst into bloom. So I'm trying it with this one. And the first thing it's done is produce a spike. So, I now agree. Okay, that's a pretty poor scientific experiment with one plant, but it worked. I've had that plant a long time, and it grows well for me, but it's never bloomed. So give it more light, now it does. Uh, I've got quite a lot of telumnias. Um, I enjoy these, they take up very little space. Um, and, quite honestly, with a few basic rules, they're one of the easiest orchids to grow. Um, the rules are basically just observing how they grow in the wild. Yes, they're epiphets, but they're a special type. They're a twig epiphet, which means they grow on little tiny twigs in low-growing shrubbery and stuff like that. So you very rarely find them on a large branch or on a trunk. And where they grow, their roots are not growing in anything. They're just clinging onto the twigs. And therein lies the secret. You bury the roots on telumnias in things and keep them wet and the roots will rot. They need 
basically a daily wet dry cycle ideally which makes them hard work on a mount but I think they're worth it. Got quite a few in bloom at the moment including this this is a first time bloomer well pleased with that it opens red and then fades to a deep pink and I think eventually it's going to fa fade even more to a paler pink but each of its phases of colour is still good and then this pink one over here that's very attractive that that fades as well as it ages it's another little uh, darker one up here and um, although these two look identical they're not um, this is uh, golden sunray sunshine golden sunshine sunray one or the other and this one is tolumnia peach they look very similar but they're not this one tends to have the peachy colors in a veined form and is slightly larger but is basically the same type of colors and then this one has its peachy colors in a more uniform pattern but I like my tolumnias the rest of them live up here when they're not in bloom um, where they get good light bordering on going purple purple spots means virtually perfect light if they start to turn deep purple you're overcooking them <laughs> you might want to bring them down a bit but my only species up here Europhila um, is branching at the moment because some clumsy clod actually broke the end of the spike off oh, the spikes do get ridiculously long on that species um, yeah, there's some, some catlias. Catlias have been doing quite well recently. Some have gone over recently, but my uh, apple blossom is looking good. The lovely red one there is just starting to drop its blooms now, which is a shame. And then a couple of uh, named in one case and unnamed in another. So there's some catlias. What else have I got? I've got a little uh, cycopsis living up in there. Only the one. It's a relatively new plant and a relatively young plant, so it's never bloomed. Um, more Miltonias over here. Um, I've got a couple of mounted Phalaenopsis that live in here. <laughs> they don't like my winter, it's too cold. <laughs> but oh, they just hide away there, I don't worry about them too much quite honestly. My only Zygopetalum that um, borderline died and then decided to throw out a little weak growth, which is this one. And now it's just starting another new one and it's grown some roots so it might survive. I think I've killed four of them so far so I'm not getting any more but if that one makes it great. That's my um, Bulbophyllum Elizabeth Ann Buckleberry. That's chucking new growths out left right and centre all over the place. Um, seems to quite like living in that bowl. It's uh, quite easy to keep moist in there which is good. Um, I grow live sphagnum moss as well which I do use sometimes um, just literally these are like seed trays but with no holes in so they do actually hold a layer of water um, so, and I've also got some other types of moss over here well, that tray looks a bit bedraggled at the moment because I've just used some of the moss so it's got to grow back again or I'll have to go and find some more um, so that's a look round the types of plants um, heavy on the dendrobiums, um, this was a new plant last year and I did not expect that to bloom. Um, if you take the four largest canes on the right hand side that's what I grew last year. So if you can in your imagination remove those from the plant and see what's left that's what I bought and I didn't think it was big enough to bloom. Well, you can be wrong sometimes. <laughs> and when you're wrong that way round, I don't mind that. So that's going to be quite a show in a minute. That's Dendrobium Lindleyi. And uh, <laughs> we'll clear that up straight away. It's not Dendrobium aggregatum, but if you want to call that, the RHS have said it's allowable as a synonym. That plant was discovered by Lindley, and it was called Dendrobium Lindleyi. So who decided it ought to be called aggregatum, I don't know. But it's been like that for a very, very, very long time. And Dendrobium jenkinsii was even accused of being a variety of aggregatum at one point. But the RHS have laid it down now. That is a separate species, given that it's less than half the size, has totally different blooms, totally different spikes. <laughs> it's different. <laughs> Lies flat. 
as opposed to sticking up in the air. And the Lindley Eye, that's its accepted name with a synonym of aggregatum. So you're still allowed to use it if you want to stay in the Dark Ages. So that's that. This monster over here that's starting to get, make my eyes water a little bit with the fragrance is an unusual plant. I got this off of Arlene. And she took great delight in bringing it all the way from um, uh, wherever we have our show, I've forgotten, begins with a P, <laughs> where she lives, all the way to the Bournemouth Orchid Society um, to put in the auction. And at the time it was in bloom and she had a reserve on it and nobody even bid on it. They are a tight lot. But nonetheless, I think a lot of it is that many people, at, certainly at Bournemouth, it seems to be more noticeable, have specialised a bit. Well, if they haven't specialised in the plant that's on offer, it doesn't matter how good it is, they probably don't want it, despite this being an excellent bargain. Anyway, it's come on well for me, and um, it's in all its glory at the moment, and it's uh, an unusual plant, because all you judges that are watching... Hang on, let me get back so you can get an idea of scale, yeah? That is, without a shadow of doubt, Dendrobium chrysotoxum. Look it up. Small to medium. Wherever you read, which just goes to show, what you read is not always the real world. It can grow into a monster. It's not a named variety or anything like that, that's just the standard species. And I had to look up on the internet to verify because many people on my YouTube channel said that can't be Chrysotoxum, it's twice the size it should be, it's got to be something else. Well, I did a verification on bloom, size, shape, colour, patterning, everything. That matches perfectly number of leaves on the canes, where the actual blooms come from, time of year it blooms, it matches perfectly in every detail, except for the fact it's nearly twice as big as it should be. I'm sticking with that name until proven otherwise. <laughs> but it is one of my monsters. And talking of monsters, some of the um, plants up there are brassias. There's quite a mixture, that shelf. There's some cattleyas up there. Um, a couple of brassia types, there's even a couple of dendrobiums tucked up there. So that shelf is variable and um, that shelf has literally only been set up today because this used to live there and it was getting towards the roof. This has currently got five spikes that are, they're already two thirds of a metre long, apart from this little one here. It'll catch up. Um, now this is Typical eyes bigger than the stomach. I went to Burnham's um, 70th, 70th anniversary do, their private function that they held for invited guests only. Oh, didn't you get invited? Oh, shame. Anyway, I did. <laughs> and when you're in the Burnham sales area, there's a scale related issue that you can be fooled by. And there was a row of these. Um, it's actually. Um, Brassia varicosum, varicosum, sea breeze. Um, I think it might even be one of Burn Burnham's own um, named varieties. And they all look marvellous. And I thought, I'm having one of them. And, you know, you're, they were on the floor. So you're looking down at them as well. And I, I sort of got it in the car. <laughs> and then I got it home and walked in here with it. And I thought, the hell am I going to put that? It's far too big. So, eyes bigger than the stomach. Um, I chose this one out of the others because I think it had four spikes at the time, but it had five new growths. It had the most number of new growths. So, irrespective of the blooms, which probably weren't going to last that long anyway, forget that. Look at the plant. And the plant said, I've got five new growths. None of the others have, so why don't you pick me? So, I did. And this one's actually started its next, next set of new growths already. They're, they're just starting down the bottom here. And I think I'm going to have six this time round, which would be good. But it is a bit of a monster. As soon as the spikes come, you know, they, they need staking. I would love to let those spikes arch over with the big brassier spider blooms all along the, 
the length of an arching cane. But there's five of them and they're going to head off in different directions. It's going to take up half my grow room, even though it would look quite stunning. So something I very, very rarely do, I've had to stake the spikes. I just don't like staked spikes. I like spikes to do their own thing and arch over naturally. Um, but anyway, it had to be done, basically. Um, I think now, if I took the stakes, uh, the stakes off, they, they'd be self-supporting. I mean, I don't think that clip is actually holding that thing up. But I'll leave them there as they're there for now. They spoil the look, in my opinion, the canes, but what else can I do? I needed the plant vertical, not horizontal. <laughs> Just take up too much space. Right, so that's some of the plants and um, where I grow them. Um, I've got a lot of twinkles, all that style of Oncidium, I like them. They're small, they're compact, um, and they chuck out frequently two new growths per old pseudo bulb. So where you had one, you get two. So they expand in size quite rapidly. And certainly on most of my twinkles, each bulb is highly likely to have two spikes, minimum of one. So on that plant, for example, let's just whiz round quickly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. There's over a dozen new growths on there, times two spikes, earns its keep, well worth its keep. That's tiny twinkle, that one. <laughs> That's its name, not its size, but it is like a miniature version. There's a lot of different twinkles, which is strange because they all have the backup of Sotoanum, which is a giant. And yet nearly all the twinkles have a, a smallish size to them. Right, so I hope you've enjoyed this little tour. It's not really a talk. Um, it wasn't meant to be. It was meant to be something that people stuck at home can sit down and enjoy from somebody they know. Um, you know, because a lot of the speakers that come in are total strangers. But there again, they speak on a topic. I didn't want to pick a topic. I just wanted to have a look round, a chat about the grow room, which once was a conservatory. Once upon a time, there was a sofa here, big comfy armchair over here, coffee table, carpet on the floor, it was just a conservatory. And most of the time it was either too hot, you couldn't come out here, good for drying the washing, but that was about all, or it was freezing cold. And I didn't see the justification in heating it for the very rare occasions I might want to come and sit in it. So it was wasted space. So it's been adapted and refined over the years to become this, um, which is my little paradise. My little area of paradise. Well that just opened today as well. You might be interested in that. It's a little Sylogeny Knitida. New name, replacing the old one. And I'm quite happy with the new name because I can say it. I had trouble saying the old name. So all or Croatia or, or Crusher or something or other. Anyway, Knitida is just slips off the tongue nicely. Very fragrant. <laughs> Doing well on the fragrance here. Um, obviously the Chrysotoxin is very fragrant. You've also got the Apple Blossom, very fragrant. Over here, Dendrobium Nesta, highly fragrant. Smells of raspberries. And the Anosmum up here, smells of raspberries, highly fragrant. And um, this is fragrant as well, but you'd never tell because it can't compete with what's going on out here at the moment. Um, I've yet to have a Tolumnia that's fragrant, but uh, you know, you never know, <laughs> one day. And this little, uh, this is a Victoria Regina cross, um, crossed with, come on brain, Goldschmidtianum, I believe. Um, and it's almost in permanent bloom. It had a bit of a break in the winter, a couple of months. And now it's off again. Um, it's still got lots of canes up here that are new, that haven't actually bloomed yet. Um, and the new growths have just started. So it grows quite well for me and it just stays in constant bloom. Obviously it hasn't got the colour that Victoria Regina has. Nothing has that colour that I know of. Um, but it just keeps on blooming. So there's quite an assortment out here. 
they all sort of get on together and um, there are some warmer growers that are not happy in the winter and some cooler growers that are not happy in the summer and an awful lot that don't mind either way so it's taken a long time to build the collection up and try things out and find things that just about work okay they're tolerable things that seem to work great brilliant we'll have some more of them and things that just grow like weeds out here well we'll have some more of them but if I didn't try the new genus every now and again I wouldn't know would I so there's a bit of experimentation happens you know now and again and as I said, this year it's Renantheras. We'll see how we do with them. They might all die come the winter time because they're too cold. I suspect they will just stop growing rather than actually keel over. But they, they will just stop growing in those lower temperatures, I suspect. So as long as they can hang in there, and then they'll get going again when the warmer weather comes with any luck. Right, um, it's nice to have had your company. And um, I hope you're all looking after yourselves. Stay at home. Play with your dogs, play with your ta cats, play with your computers, watch telly, watch some films. Go for your short walks, stay away from other people, don't invite your mates round. You know the rules and they're there for a reason. For me, I don't need them. As far as I'm concerned, it's common sense. If I'm not going to catch this, then I don't need to get near anybody. So nobody comes in the house. Anybody who delivers anything leaves it well outside the front door and I go and get it. And after I've dealt with it and unwrapped it, I do me hands. So I don't get near anybody. The only time I'm venturing out at the moment is for essentials, which at the moment is nothing more than food. Well, and drink. <laughs> oh, you've got to have a sip of wine now and again, of course. But yeah, that's it. So every three, four, maybe even five days, I venture around to the local little supermarket do my shopping, get out quick, sort my hands out so that I don't take anything into the car with me, get home, get that door shut and locked. So I'm safe. Yeah? <laughs> and I can't affect anybody else because I'm in here, busy with my orchids. So that's why those rules are there. And quite honestly, I'd rather they didn't start slacking them off. I think we'll get another surge, but that's an opinion. I'm not a medical person, but uh, I'm staying out of the way of people long term. This isn't a short term thing for me. Um, I'm getting on a bit, you know, so I'm looking after myself. And I'll see you at the next meeting as and when that may be. Who knows? What I would really like is for it all to be back up and running again for the garden party. Now, I miss the meetings, I miss chatting with people, I miss looking at the plants, but do you know what I miss more than everything? Anything? <laughs> Homemade cake. <laughs> See you again sometime, look after yourselves. Bye for now. <laughs>